Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Anne Shiloh. Thanks, Clarissa. Uh, I hate these things. I hardly recognise myself, so thank you so much. Right. Let's get started. When I work out my technology. You can hear me, can't you? And it's working? Good. Perfect. This recent portrait of Barack Obama by Kinde Wiley uh, is an imposing work. It's seven feet, which is 2.13 meters in size. So it's a really big, impressive portrait. And it's caused something of a stir in the media and in the arts presses. Using this picture of the painting, I'm going to use it as a springboard in this talk and take a personal look at portraiture, or more specifically, looking at a figure in a floral setting. I'm going to draw on my own predilections uh, in the realm of art theory, history, and meaning. I wasn't trained as an art historian, but more as a co visual cultural theorist. And that makes a difference because I'm not so interested in historical facts, in artists' lives, in their work, improving the worth of a particular artist and his, his or her practice, I should say. Rather, I'm interested in meaning. I'm interested in looking at how ideas circulate around visual images, what we see and what we apprehend. One of the privileges of being given free reign, and I was told I could speak about anything, is that you can talk about your favorite things. So I'm going to look at three paintings or images that sprung to mind when I first saw this particular portrait. And I'm going to use those as a way of exploring the meanings here. I'm going to talk a little bit about the symbolism of flowers, about the presentation of the self in portraiture, which involves not only how one sees oneself, but also how one would prefer others to view them. And then, by way of conclusion, think about how ideas are intricately connected with discourses surrounding power, knowledge, and understanding. So, let me begin. And I apologize if I keep moving out in and out of voice. I do a lecture dance, so uh, I'll try and keep focused. When I first saw this painting, the image that came to my mind was the Virgin in the Garden. It's a theme really popular in medieval art. Uh, you see it in church frescoes, in tapestries, and it's of an enclosed garden which has a symbolic meaning in referring to Mary's virtue and also spiritual repose. And it brought to mind this particular secular illumination by the master of the hours of the Duke de Burgundy. It's an illustration for Boccaccio's Tessida and it's a particular favorite image of mine. It's not the virgin, but a virgin. Emilia. And please remember, this isn't to scale. While Obama's portrait is massive and imposing and a public thing, this is a really intimate personal. It's the size of a book. So even though you're seeing a really large version of it, it's something you'd be holding in your hand and viewing singularly in those sort of intimate moments. Boccaccio's story was very popular in the Middle Ages, and probably still is, if you can find it on Google. Um, it's a tale of knightly valor, of love and daring do. It's a really epic story that is divided into 12 books. And it's about the life and times of an ancient Greek hero, Theseus. However, most of the story focuses on the rivalry between Palermo and a Akita, and let's move. And here we see Palamon and Asita, I should say it probably. They're in prison, staring through the prison bars into the garden 
where Amelia is reposing. So readers in the medieval world had great intertextuality and really good visual interpretation skills. The sacred and the profane were free-floating signifiers. So moral tales, biblical stories, parables, all worked alongside each other. They were very acute in reading something and seeing multiple levels of meaning. So in looking at this image, moment of these men looking at the virgin in the garden, but they'd see all the references associated with it. So they might think of Susanna and the elders. They might think of the virgin in the garden. They might also think of the Duke of Burgundy and the courtly life surrounding um, his society at the time. So these levels of meaning would be operating in this particular image. But I'd like to take a little bit of a closer look at it because what occurs to me most, what I see most when I look at this page is the flowers. They dominate the page in the marginalia and in the picture itself. So while Amelia is a character in the knightly tale and standing for the virgin, she's also associated with a lot of symbolic uh, virtues that the depiction of the virgin carries with in the garden. And when we look at in the association with the flowers, the flowers here carry both the secular and the religious meanings. For example, in the garden where she's sitting, roses are particularly important. The rose is the flower of the virgin. White is for purity. And red is for the blood of Christ. They're the religious meanings, but also there's the secular associations of true love, of chastity. When we look at the violets, which are in the middle of the um, detail, violets are for humility and modesty. But they're also for courtly love and innocence and virtue. The red carnations, they're for the tears of Christ, but they're also about faithfulness and affection. So the savvy medieval reader would be able to see these flowers and interpret both the secular and the religious meanings. These were very potent symbols for them. Looking at this and then returning to the portrait, He's surrounded by vines and flowers. These flowers are not merely decorative devices, but carry meaning, much like the image of um, the Virgin and the manuscript. Kinde Wale was renowned for quoting art history and for using those tropes in art history in his work. For him, the flowers depicted here have specific symbolic meaning so it's not just an innocent, let's paint flowers around, but an attended meaning. In looking at Obama, these conventions then become quite important. We see the parallel of, or um, a symbolic reference to the Middle Ages in this fecund foliage. The symbolism of flowers become important. So, we have the perfect purple African lily, which is a sign of Barack Obama's Kenyan heritage. We have the chrysanthemum, which is the flower for Chicago, which is the home city of Barack and uh, where he was first a state senator. There's the white jasmine, which connotes his Hawaiian heritage, uh, birthplace and also the time he spent in Indonesia. And the ever popular and present red rosebuds, that medieval symbolism again of love and courage. So there's a relationship I'm seeing here between the symbolism of flowers and early medieval work. So let's hold that idea to one side and move to my second touchstone, a portrait by my favourite artist, Ang. 
I love this work. I, I, I saw, saw it in the National Gallery years ago. Um, it's beautiful. Well, I find it beautiful. Flowers overrun this portrait. It's described by Eileen Ribeiro as a depiction of a dress that is almost ferocious in its intensity, in its pattern and ornamentation. The ferocious flowers are enveloping this woman. So focusing on this work, I want to talk a little bit about portraiture as the presentation of the self. Ang's portraits of society women are really complex images. Sarah Betzer suggests that he disliked working with women. They were fidgety, they were always preening themselves, they were always wanting to see, hey, what do I look like now? You know, it's the sort of 19th century selfie. Oh, do I look like that? Oh, I better change. Um, he hated that activity. And it suggested that he used to use models, hired models, so he could block in the portrait first, the, how the figure was sitting, and then paint the sitter's features over the top so he could avoid that horror of these women continually worrying about what they look like. Now, while a number of art historians argue that Ang loathed portraiture, considering it a secondary art to that of uh, history painting, Betza suggests that with portraiture, he was really considering questions surrounding both history and reality. He was using the depiction as a way of coming to terms with those possibly different approaches to thinking about people. He was looking for the true depiction of the person in their flesh and blood, but he was also considering the story which they wished to be remembered by, their moment in history. So their presentation of themselves for public scrutiny is working with the presentation of themselves as themselves. So Ang grapples history painting and present reality with the surface of the canvas. So when we look at Madame Motossier, what do we see? She was a very influential society figure at the time. Her husband was a rich, wealthy merchant, so she had money and time to spend. She had power, she had social position, she had money. And this portrait does as much to show her status as it does to show who she is. So we can see those status symbols, the wonderful fabric, the beautiful flowers that are you know, devouring her body almost, um, her, her fan, her jewelry, her, uh, the furnishings around her. These are all talking about her status and giving her some sort of claim within the society of the time. There's so much reference here to classical Rome and, and uh, classicism and antiquity. Even if you look at, in the mirror, um, the portrait of her, it's almost like a Roman cameo. And when you look at the drawings that led up to this. You can also see reference to Roman fre frescoes and portraiture within Roman frescoes, how it's posed. So there's a very evident history going on here, a history painting about a woman. So those social status, these ideas are coming into the fore. But it's also a real woman. We know from Oh, I'm looking at the wrong page. I said, we know from the Virgin? No, sorry. <laughs> we, know, we know from looking at correspondence with Ang that she was a very statuesque woman of quite some size, but she was also very concerned about her appearance in public. And friends suggested to Ang that it might be wise if the lady is slimmed down a little bit. She was very concerned about her bingo wings. So the, it suggested that the portrait has slimmed her down to make her more approachable and beautiful. 
So we start to question then the reality of this flesh and blood. Who is she? Who are we looking at? Portraiture then becomes this pivotal moment, a temporal fix on who this person is at the moment of depiction, how they wish to be presented and portrayed, how they wish to be remembered in history. Their portraits are important statements then about the presentation of the self. It's about the artist and their oeuvre, as well as the artist's mark on history. And it's also about the sitter. It's this negotiation between painter and person. So what might Wiley's portrait of Obama then tell us about him? And here's a lovely image of Obama standing next to his portrait. Again, you get that sense of scale. I've selected just a few portraits from the Smithsonian Institute where his portrait hangs. And these are just some of the very strong, powerful presidential figures that you find in the portrait gallery. I want you to imagine walking into a gallery, say like this space, where these portraits are all hanging and then encountering Obama. It's a bit like an, an Hawaiian shirt at a cocktail party where it's black tie. I mean, it, wow, what was that we were looking at? You look at them, they are very upright, sincere, serious, dark black and white, dare I say boring people. They are powerful people. I doubt the current president or even Charlton Heston would consider being represented like this, like some sort of tree-hugging, greeny, girly man. He can't even stand on his own two feet like a real man. Real men. What is he? Some sort of hippie poof to be Joe Wanker? You know, he, he just doesn't fit the mould of a proper, powerful, patriarchal figure. However, if, as Holland Carter suggests, portraits of the powerful are at some level both political and personal propaganda, then this portrait of Obama is the story of a man and the story of a leader of a nation. The way of portraying the person, the power of his position. So what do you see when you look at this man? What do you see about his image? I look at Obama's portrait and I immediately think of the presentation of the self. How he sits in this field of vines and flowers as though the natural world is swallowing him up. Is it protecting him? Enveloping him? Hiding him? If he sits there long enough, will he disappear altogether? The vines were creeping up his leg. It's a question that leads me to my final image. And it's one you can see around the corner in the flesh. It's Claire McFarlane's work. In looking at her work, you might be forgiven for seeing them as merely decorative patterns. Her use of motives derived from William Morris prints have that ubiquity of a genteel domestic interior. But look again. McFarland is doing more than painting pretty pictures of floral wallpaper. Her work deals with questions about power and knowledge. How scientific thought, imperial power, the colonization of lands, and the promulgation of ideas are all implicated in how we today 
understand the world. So if you look again at these works, you'll notice in the center depictions of Australian flora. They sit as interruptions to the unified decor of that 19th century colonial charm of the wallpaper. So there's interruptions here in this rather calm, standard wallpaper, floral wallpaper. So her work leads me again to think about Wiley's portrait. Perhaps Obama is sitting here as some sort of disruption to the narrative. Maybe he's a glitch in the system of patriarchal power. Or is he? What does this painting tell you about the man? Thank you. Let's talk loud. <laughs> <laughs>